They're confused when they see countries around the world like Ireland, Sweden, Norway, Switzerland, the Czech Republic, Israel, Denmark, Spain, and the UK, who have either dropped almost all restrictions or are fast moving in that direction. All countries, I note, with lower vaccination rates than us. Now, while folks are hearing and seeing all of this, they're left rightfully wondering, where the hell are we heading here in Canada? I think there lies the frustration. They feel there is no appetite from our government to adapt so as to reflect the changing data and the changing reality of the pandemic and of the world. They're worried that measures which ought to be exceptional and limited in time are being normalized with no end in sight, like vaccine passports, mandates, and requirements for travelers. They're worried because they feel, they feel it is becoming harder and harder to know where public health stops and where politics begins. Now, I firmly believe governments would do well not to dismiss these legitimate concerns and not to demonize those who voice them. To the contrary, I believe these concerns need to be addressed head on. And here are some ways I humbly submit we could go about it. First, <clears throat> I believe the government should provide quickly a roadmap with clear and measurable targets to lift all restrictions within its purview. To be clear, I do not necessarily believe that all measures should be lifted immediately, but I do believe that we must have a clear and measurable benchmark for when measures will be lifted. For instance, at what point can we lift restrictions while respecting the capacity of the province's healthcare systems? Second, I believe that if more and more Canadians find it hard to comply with the restrictions, it's not because they lack solidarity. It's because increasingly Canadians don't understand the measures and they don't understand them because governments no longer care to explain them. It's a lot easier to comply when you understand, particularly when these restrictions impact your day-to-day -day life. The vaccine requirement for truckers to me is a good example. And if we forget about the demonstrations and we forget about the convoy for just a second and look at that policy for what it is. This is a policy that now goes against the World Health Organization's recommendation and for which no epidemiological studies and projections have been provided. Meanwhile, the industry is clear. When this measure took effect, the price of transport for fresh products from the United States went up by 15 to 20 percent on average. Now, I understand there are many factors contributing to inflation, but inflation happens over time, not overnight. This is not a small consequence, given that Canadians are already facing the highest inflation in 30 years. And unfortunately, it affects more the most vulnerable amongst us. The impact is not the same if you make 200 or 300,000 a year versus if you make 15 to 20 bucks an hour. At least if the benefits were clearly explained with data and projections, not with talking points, it could make the burden more bearable. I've been looking for this data for weeks, but to no avail. This leads me to humbly suggest that the government should systematically publish the epidemiological projections and the scientific analysis underpinning the measures it imposes going forward. Third, to echo the comments I quoted earlier by Dr. Tam, we need to be building our capacity right now to face the next waves. As such, I believe the government should start negotiating the Canada health transfers with provinces without delays. The government's position is quite frankly hard to understand. On the one hand, we say that we will not be negotiating the transfer before the pandemic ends. And on the other hand, we say that the pandemic will last for years. If we want to be able to truly live with the virus without resorting to the violence of lockdowns, these discussions cannot wait. There is no doubt that provinces have a lot to do to improve their healthcare systems and to gain in efficiency, but the federal government also has its role to play. At last, I think it's time to stop dividing Canadians, to stop pitting one part of the population against another. I can't help but notice with regret that both the tone and the policies of my government changed drastically on the eve and during the last election campaign. From a positive and unifying approach, 
a decision was made to wedge, to divide, and to stigmatize. I fear that this politicization of the pandemic risks undermining the public's trust in our public health institutions. This is not a risk we ought to be taking lightly. In this last year, Canada has reached one of the highest levels of vaccination in the world. It is something we should be proud of. It is something we should be celebrating. Yet here we are, more divided than ever. It's time to stop with the division and the distractions. It's time to choose positive, not coercive methods. It's time to unite. And finally, though I am alone voicing these concerns publicly today, I can tell you that I'm not the only one who feels to varying degrees, as I do within our ranks. I remain hopeful that this call for more humanism, for more reason, and for more hope will be heard. I want to thank you all for your attention.